<laughs> All right, hello everyone. This is day four. Uh, so if we start uh, counting Espa as well, uh, so I appreciate for those who join us today. I think there's a lot of great conversations happening in parallel. Some of the side rooms. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, today is uh, mastering phase two. So as most of you know by now, we have a three-phased master plan. Phase one is accumulating tons of capacity, which we have right now, which is more than 10 exabyte on the network. Uh, phase two is all about onboarding real uh, customers, paying customers. And so that's the phase we're in right now. And so I wanted to share a few things that we have um, identified and also the things that we're working on to help our ecosystem with this. Uh, first and foremost, I think all of us know we're in a bear market. It's pretty freezing. I should have <laughs> brought my jacket because... Uh, it is, it is cold out there, but at the same time, we are making a ton of progress because when a market goes through transition phase, um, we're actually being forced to have the tough conversations faster. And that's what we're hearing and feeling and definitely um, you know, going through right now. Just a little bit of a background story for those who have been with us uh, for the last four years. They know this, but those who haven't and are just entering our ecosystem, it's actually important to understand that we have been here for quite some time and we have actually gone through multiple bear cycles successfully. And if you look at the first one, uh, back in 2013, it was a bear cycle. And uh, that's the time when IPFS was started by Juan. 2014 it was originally officially announced and uh, PL was founded. And then eventually we moved on to Falcoin after building Lip P2P in 2018, 2019. Um, and IP and uh, and um, yeah, and IPFS uh, got major adoption across these two bear markets, um, and is now actually being used as one of the default uh, file uh, systems or um, infrastructure systems in Web3. <clears throat> and um, so, lip P2P, for those who don't know, is also used in the Ethereum stack. So, quite a lot of adoption of the tooling that we have built as an engineering team across Web3. And now it's the phase, um, now is our phase, now is our time to bring those technologies to the Web2 world. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, today, as we see, you know, it's a um, <clears throat> bear's market has been going on for quite some time. But again, we're seeing really positive signals from real use cases, users, data aggregators that are joining our network. So our network um, is also in a transition phase. Um, and the last two years, we have built a really robust data storage network. So we have more than 3,400 systems. Um, as you can see on the left upper corner, I think most of you have seen this already, but this is really the adoption curve of like uh, unique systems in our network globally. And these are you know systems that vary from a couple of hundred terabytes to a couple of hundred petabytes, right? So we have a really wide, diverse ecosystem. And um, we are distributed, the network is distributed across more than 40 countries worldwide, which is quite impressive. You know, I was talking earlier to some of the teams that, you know, um, there are, <laughs> it's unbelievable how many communities we have in our ecosystem because, you know, uh, more than a month ago, we went to Jakarta, organized an event, and we didn't know more than 700 people would show up. And that's just in Jakarta alone. And then we had um, events in Seoul, in Singapore, Hong Kong, um, all of these were extremely well attended. And what they all have in common is the same passion for Falcon and the, uh, the, the strong you know, desire to make this uh, a successful network. We are not just um, building uh, storage providers, we're actually building businesses and we're helping data clients to move their data to the network. So on the right, you're seeing some of the logos that we have built, which is fantastic. Some really major accounts like CERN, um, Internet Archive, you see Berkeley, Generate, and so on, and even the SETI that sent a signal from space and stored it on IPFS and archived it on Falcon, which is very impressive. And so what you've seen in the last year, on the bottom left, um, you see that green graph. Um, we actually have you know, accelerated the adoption and, and brought in a lot of data sets to the network in just the last year. We've seen this really accelerated growth, and that's because... Our ecosystem, mostly our storage providers themselves, have gone to um, uh, customers and onboarded a lot of public data sets onto the network. And we want to continue that now. So we want to move this to paying deals. So we want to really increase 
these uh, deals that are coming onto the network from, you know, free deals, which is what we've in most cases have been focused on, to really paying deals. And as you can see here in this graph, this is the adoption curve. So the blue is still the total number of systems um, globally deployed. The red is the adoption of those systems taking on deals, so actually storing real data. And as you can see today, we're at actually this graph is <coughs> probably three weeks old. So we actually already achieved more than 50% at this point, and it's continuing to grow. Because remember, on a daily basis, the network is onboarding around three to six petabytes of data, which is <laughs> enormous. Um, and so what we want to focus on in this next wave um, is that uh, paying the, the percentage of paying deals. We need to move that up, right? And that's really um, important for us, not only because we want to bring external capital into our ecosystem, which is, you know, again, expressed as our GDP, right? As you can, uh, you can kind of compare this to our GDP, but also um, it's because that will demonstrate true value and that will demonstrate, um, you know, the, the, the real utility that we bring to the network and to the Web2 world. So, where we are right now is we are still heavily focused on early adopters, innovators that really understand the value of verifiability, verifiable storage, verifiable, verifiable data. Um, and if you actually um, follow some of the latest podcasts and uh, even from, you know, Sergey, the, the CEO of Google and um, other real, uh, real like Web2 um, industry veterans, they're starting to talk about verifiability. They're talking about the need for um, us to understand and verify that the data that was created was really created by the person who said they created it. Because there's a lot of deep fakes, and now with LLMs, there's a lot of uncertainty, and, and uh, that creates opportunity for us. So, but my point is that today, we're still like focusing on these early adopters, and we need to move to enterprise, SaaS, and AI, and many more use cases. And so we need to bridge that chasm, and so how are we going to do that? <coughs> now, let me see if it works. I'm losing my... Uh, all right, there we go. So um, before we go down this path, I wanted to take us, take us uh, 15 years back. Um, because what happened 15 years ago, <coughs> we had a very similar problem. right? Amazon came out with their object storage or S3 interface in 2006. And I remember that time very well because we were I was at the time at another startup and we were all <coughs> looking at it as like, well, you know, users will never store their data in the cloud. That's a, why would enterprises do that? That's just too, too scary. I mean, giving up their data sets to this uh, central entity. Now, what happened is in 2008, very quickly, because S3 is a, was a new interface and hard to use and most applications was using file systems, you saw this evolution of on-ramps coming online that, you know, Avir, Panzura, many, many others, I couldn't find all the logos anymore because they eventually were purchased. And they were purchased actually by the cloud vendors. They actually were purchased by Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, which is very interesting. But basically these, these on-ramps were doing the translation from file to object to make it very easy to move data into the cloud. And so in, it took till 2015 to 2020 before some of the standard Web2 enterprise backup and data management stacks would support the S3 storage interface as a target to store data. And so it took eventually 15 years um, and actually longer now to really see user, mass user adoption of these, um, these um, uh, Web2, uh, or mass adoption of these S3 interfaces into the Web2 apps. And today, of course, it's commodity. Everyone understands S3. All applications speak that language, and it becomes sort of like a default setting for most. But um, it took a very long time. And so where we are today in our network is in that phase where you know, Amazon was at, or object storage was at in 2008. We're now like building the connectors and we are integrating with these apps and these apps are now ISVs that we are, some of them are here in the room that are building these early connections into decentralized storage. So what are we, what are we protocol labs contributing to the network to accelerate this movement and to build the connection between web two and web three? Um, so one is um, we gotta like focus on uh, making sure that 
Um, our engineering efforts are driving towards making the Falcon network more accessible to main users. Uh, we have to increase awareness because a lot of this is not just like building technology and building product. It's also, you know, advocating for those capabilities. Like, for example, the verifiability is a new thing. Uh, people don't understand what it means. Um, and so we have to advocate and we have to demonstrate through real case studies and use cases and workflows and reference architectures how it's being done. And so part of that actually uh, to get there is we started a decentralized storage alliance. Some of you uh, are part of that. And that is really with a goal to not just, it shouldn't just come that message from Protocol Labs or the Falcon Foundation. It should come from the industry veterans that actually you know, know this world really well and are um, currently talking to enterprise customers. So that's the second one. And third, we need to generate new recurrent revenue streams because, you know, if you talk to our engineers, you know, they will talk to you about smart contracts and how you can build new DAOs, data DAOs, and build new business cases and new business revenue streams. But, you know, that's really hard for an enterprise customer to absorb if they're not even comfortable with, like, the benefits of decentralized storage uh, as a whole. So my point is there's a lot of opportunity that we can unlock and that is being, that is being unlocked by these uh, Web3 through, Web through developers today. But uh, before enterprises will take that on, it will take a while. We have to first get our foot in the door, store some data onto the Falcon network, integrate with these Web2 apps, and then we can expand from there and like expose them to the smart contract capabilities and really differentiate. Um, so what are we doing? <coughs> um, to make Falcon accessible to the, to the end user? Um, well, there's a couple of problems that we've seen so far. So as I mentioned before, one, the interface is really hard, right? Falcon has completely different new interface. It's content addressable. We have this concept and this notion of a CID, which is a unique identifier, a global unique identifier, which is extremely powerful because that means that with that one unique identifier, you can uh, identify a unique, in a unique way, any single data uh, asset, file, you name it, in the world. And so everyone can speak and can, can use that, uh, that interface and, and communicate with each other in the same way. But um, applications are not used to uh, CIDs, of course, and so we have to make the connection. And also, all these applications don't understand uh, how to integrate with our Falcon network. So what we've done is we've actually built a REST interface. Um, it, you can deploy it on a container. And so that REST interface is just a very simple shim. It speaks put, get, delete, very similar to what you would see with an S3, but a little bit proprietary in the sense that um, we can pull forward some of the unique capabilities that the decentralized network brings, which are, one, this unique identifier, and two, proofs uh, that are sort of built into our stack. So obviously the proof of replication, which is you know one of the core tenants of Falcoin, which uh, kind of verifies the data on a daily basis and, and ensures through cryptographic hashing that the data is still the same uh, on a daily basis, right? Uh, in a scalable way is super unique and we wanna pull that forward into the application stack through this REST interface. And what's the value there? The value there is that one, for application developers or applications in general in Web2, they um, can now easily move data in and out of the network to they were still able to report on the unique identifier and the uh, last time the data was verified on chain. And so what it allows us to do is to bring that verifiability all the way into the application stack. And with that, we can do a lot of things. Because you know, there's some examples where uh, definitely in the insurance industry, it was brought up by one of our partners, uh, this could actually um, become like a good proof to demonstrate that the data that is stored on chain is still the original data set and could help in ransomware use cases. And why is that important? We are here at MGM Park and MGM <laughs> got hacked two, two weeks ago and they're still uh, struggling with uh, the outcome of that. So the second layer, um, which is really hard for a lot of uh, traditional application developers, developers is really the data preparation. In Falcon, you need to, s to prepare the data in a certain format. And um, this, again, is all to ensure that the data is securely stored and the network um, can act in a permissionless way, which is really important because um, you have to make the, 
the uh, the network's so secure that anyone can just join without an approval, without the KYC, and still contribute to the network in a very consistent and secure way without uh, any human inter intervention. And that's very crucial. And and honestly, that's one of the strengths of Falcon too, because it's been running for almost three years in a month from now at a very large scale, and it's been you know pretty. Uh, it's been pretty consistent and pretty strong. I mean, it's it hasn't gone down. And again, we we have seen a tremendous amount of people coming in, it's people leaving the ecosystem. But that's actually the whole power of 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 the code, basically. So the third one is the deal making itself. So once you've prepared the data, you've ingested it through the REST interface, you've prepared the data. Then the last step is how do you actually make a deal with a storage provider in our ecosystem? And because we have so many storage providers and we also don't always know our storage providers because actually that's the benefit of this network, um, we have to ensure that there's tooling that um, automates the process from, you know, or between a client and a storage provider. And so this deal engine that is being built, which is called Spade in this case, um, kind of automates that process and makes sure that you as a user has uh, have options um, in how and where uh, to store your data and what is important to you. So for example, if you want to store it in the US, you want to be able to say, hey, I want to store it with an SP in the US. I want a, an SP that supports SOC 2 or you know, is, in a, is providing certain ver verification or qualification cert um, certificates. And so we want to build on that. And um, today there's a lot of opportunities there that we can unlock because now that we have smart contracts and we have the capability to uh, automate this process and store certificates on, on chain, um, there's a lot of things we can build on. And so that's where I think a lot of the power will come in as we expand this network and integrate with Web2 apps. So for example, one of the topics today or that we were discussed in DSA was like, how do we ensure that uh, a provider is really located in a certain region? So proof of location, quote unquote, could be a service as well and could be stored as a certificate on chain as proof that this uh, provider is, let's say, stored, storing um, data in a data center in Germany, let's say. All right, so now that we've brought, um, now that we've built all this tooling and we sort of like um, talked through the, the process, what do we need from the community? Because as a community, we're a lot stronger than just an individual entity. And we've seen our community step up and help um, the, the community as a whole. We want to bring more Web2 apps to Falcorn. So now that we have this REST interface, the ask is let's go after these legacy stacks. Let's integrate with the Veeams, the Commvaults, and the backups, the IPFS, sorry, the GPFS uh, file systems, and target them to integrate directly natively with a Falcon through this simple REST interface. Second, we need to target AI, ML, and LLM stacks because there's a huge opportunity. I don't have to explain it to you. We had some awesome presentations yesterday that zoomed in on like why investors are really interested and also why investors believe in the, the, the need for a verifiable storage stack in this uh, verifiable web. Uh, concept and so we need to get closer to these data scientists and really talk to them and really figure out and discover what use cases we can unlock with this new uh, capability. So our ask is bring those to the to the network, scan this QR code, and get the conversations going. That's because this will lead you to a solutions architect team that will help actually with those integrations, and then. The other part that we talked about was building awareness. We started the dstore.com website, uh, but its main purpose that um, what we what we realized, and not only realized, but what we've actually like, you know, felt and 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 received in a lot of the Web two conversations is that the word "corn" is uh, is sometimes uh, not very well received by the enterprise community. So we said, okay, let's just focus on what the real value props are and what decentralized storage could bring t can bring to the, the enterprise world. Because our goal is to really go after enterprise workloads. And so what we started here is like a campaign to help drive more awareness to those uh, end customers. And so what we need from all of you as well is to bring your case studies to the network. Because we have seen um, a lot of uh, community members in the field, and this is across the world, working with really interesting customers. but. You know, it's really hard for an individual entity to like make a, a big splash about it if they don't have the support from 
um, the, the Protocol Labs and the Falcon Foundation uh, team. So here what we're asking is bring all those good customers, those good stories to the network. We'll help communicate, evangelize for you. And this is all done through um, the DStore D -Store website. All right, so last but not least, right? So I think most of you understand this flywheel effect. Um, a perfect example is, you know, DSS from Australia had a, Vic had a great case study with Victor Chang. They shared it with us. We helped promote it. We did a press release around it. Very quickly after that, we had other press analysts reaching out here in the US, even though the release was in Australia, um, to learn more about it. And then they started writing an article about it. And then the week after, we actually received some leads through our dstore.com website for uh, people that basically read these uh, articles and said, hey, this is very interesting. I'm dealing with the same problem. So my point is there is this networking effect across countries, across you know, uh, regions that we should help uh, drive. And so more integrations will help drive more users, more data, more revenue, as you all know. And hopefully it will move us up into the stack as well and move from archive to backup as we improve uh, our integrations and, and, and are able to drive more value all the way up to the user stack. All right, so this is it. I appreciate everyone's coming here, so keep in mind, help us. Scan those codes if you're uh, in a position where you have a case study or you have really strong connections with a Web2, um, Web2 company or Web2 app developer because we need those. We need to start a conversation. Actually, this week alone, we, were, we already had some really good discussions because now that people know we have this, um, these tools coming out, there's just a lot more momentum that's being built because they're seeing an easy path to, do, to achieve that. All right, well, thanks everyone. I appreciate it. There's some really great speakers coming up and uh, this is the last day, so hang in there. And um, I appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. Thank you.